identifying relatively a high level uh, what we say are um, three principal difficulties in the official receiver's case, um, which are really the, 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 at a very broad level, the targets at which I will be aiming in, in <coughs> my submissions. Uh, and, and then after that, I'll, I'll come to how I'm going to proceed with, with the court's, uh, subject to the court's wishes. Uh, first, we say that it is contrary to the natural, the, the official receiver's case is contrary to the natural meaning of this, both the immediate provision which falls to interpretation of 2.8.2 R, but also that provision read uh, with this two more broadly as a code, adopting the appropriate purpose of interpretation, having regard to the object of the legislation, including consumer protection. And one can add to that, we say it's also contrary to the, to the meaning of this read in the light of uh, the Empowering Act and permissible extrinsic aids uh, to construction, which we say make it clear that the relevant knowledge for the purpose of this 2.8.2 R 2B, three-year awareness extension to the six-year limitation period, was intended to be knowledge of the OR. Secondly, we say that the OR's case is not consistent with, uh, and is indeed contrary to, the vested rights which the OR possesses as a matter of insolvency law, and the nature of those vested rights. We say that both the claim for redress from the FOS, through the act of submitting a complaint, as well as the right to redress, even if those two concepts are uh, conceptually divisible or can be atomized, as the judge would have it, um, even if that were the case, we say that both of them vest in the OR at the time of bankruptcy. It's not merely the right to redress which vests, as the OR would have it. And that has the result, if we are right, that at all material times, the OR stands in place of, or stands in the shoes of, the bankrupt by virtue of those vested rights with regard to any complaint which it makes to the FOS seeking compensation. It acts on behalf of the bankrupt in that particular sense, in the shoes of. And the OR's principal difficulty in this respect, we say, is that once it is recognised, contrary to its case, that the uh, right to complain best in the OR on bankruptcy, then it becomes extremely difficult or impossible to interpret the disp rules as treating the bankrupt rather than the OR as the complainant. And it further becomes impossible to characterise the OR as acting on behalf of uh, the bankrupt as complainant, because the bankrupt no longer has any vested claim, and the OR doesn't act on his behalf in any meaningful sense, not as agent, not in any other way, acts on behalf of the estate. And then thirdly, our thir th third uh, as it were, fundamental point is that we say the OR's case would give rise to an outcome which would be contrary to the manifest objective of this, which is to embody the same, in, in this regard, which is to embody the same fundamental concept of limitation as are to be found in the analogous limitation regime under Section 14A of the Limitation Act, which is obviously a close family relative with the same structure of six-year primary period and three-year extension. The common objective of both regimes, we say, it's not only a, a common objective, but we would say it's a common sense objective, is uh, that it is the person with the right and interest in bringing the claim as claimant, or as here complainant, who should be the person subject to the discipline of the limitation regime. Put it simply, it's the person with the ability and choice as to whether to bring the claim who's to be subject to the discipline of getting on with it, including by way of the discipline of the three-year extension of limitation by reference to that person's awareness or lack of awareness of the right to claim. And that, in, that, that advances, and only that advances, statutory objectives of, of limitation periods, 
ensuring that stale claims uh, are, not, are not permitted, uh, ensuring finality in litigation, all the interests which are protected and advanced by limitation. And we say, as, as, as the Court's already aware, that the OR's interpretation would have the consequence that the OR could sit on potential claims uh, for uh, decades, as indeed it has here. Claims go back to the year 2000, and the complaints weren't put in until 2019. And sit on them for decades before electing to complain, so long as the bankrupt, who has no interest in complaining and may have nothing to do with it, so long as the bankrupt has no active or constructive knowledge of, of his or her right to claim. And I further made the point that this would apply beyond, such a holding would apply beyond the uh, uh, OR bankruptcy scenario, similarly applied to personal representatives of the deceased person, uh, who could, in it, it, it's an even stronger case, because I think my Lord, Lord uh, Justice Nugent made, made the point, there wouldn't even be a potential adventitious uh, a circumstance of the bankrupt discovering that they had a claim, even though they had no interest, because the person being dead, there's no possibility, no, not even any possibility of, a, of, of knowledge arising if there was no knowledge at the time of death. And there would simply be no limitation period whatsoever for personal representatives. We say that would be a very surprising outcome, and indeed it's plainly not what the statutory framework requires or was intended to achieve. So th those, are, those are the broad targets, as it were. Uh, what, what I, was, uh, uh, what I uh, was proposing to do by way of submission is first to deal with some uh, preliminary points arising out of the exchanges yesterday on, on which uh, the court asked for clarification in a few matters, uh, just to get them out of the way at the outset. Secondly, uh, I think it is helpful to address the issue of the OR's rights and obligations as a matter of insolvency law first, as we did in our skeleton. The judge was plainly right to say, at paragraph six of his judgment, that the issues in this case arise at the intersection of two different regimes, the, the insolvency law regime and the financial services FISMA disc regime. But I address the, the insolvency regime first because we say one can't fully see how DISP accommodates uh, the uh, insolvency regime and complaints brought by the OR until one has analysed what rights the OR possesses. Obviously, it's a slight tick and an edic situation because you have to reach towards DISP to see what rights uh, being accommodated under the insolvency law regime. But I, 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 I'll take that first, if I may. And then I'll come on to the DISP analysis, uh, 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 starting with, it with an, uh, 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 addressing the relevant sections, and then deal with statutory purpose uh, and uh, as, as an aid to construction of DISP, uh, and, and then come to my respondents' notice points, points so far as I haven't uh, already dealt with <coughs> Lord my lady, the, the, by way of preliminary, uh, 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 at, at the very outset yesterday, um, my Lord, uh, Lord Justice Singh raised the question about the claims for declarations uh, and uh, asked about the status of those claims of declarations and the issues arising in respect of those claims. But, but the court will recall that there were two factual declarations sought by Shop Direct about knowledge. The first was on the hypothesis that the relevant knowledge was the knowledge of the OR. And the second, yeah, that, that was 1B of the declaration sort. And the second was uh, in, in, in the alternative on the basis of the bankrupt's knowledge was relevant knowledge, uh, a, a declaration about the uh, state of knowledge of, of, of the uh, bankrupt. And uh, 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 on the claim form, I, I won't turn it up, but uh, 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 core bundle, tab 10, page 99, the first was 1B and the second was 2 of the relief sought in the claim form. And those uh, two declarations are, are referred to in uh, paragraph 64 of, of uh, the judgment below. As the judge noted at paragraph uh, 65, the uh, second... I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm just looking at page 99, and I'm, I'm not seeing the first being 1B and the second being 2 of the relief sort, so uh, yes. no doubt my fault. Well, let, let me let me <coughs> it up in case I've got my numbering wrong. Um, So it, it's the last paragraph above the statement of truth. Yeah. Um, the declarations uh, A is 
the extent that the defendant as trustee, um, uh, that, that's simply the legal one. The, the awareness is the, is the uh, awareness of the official receiver, not that of the bank clerk, yeah. et cetera. It's the et cetera. And the official receiver would have become aware yes. at the time of bankruptcy or shortly thereafter. That's, that's what you've labelled 1B, but it's here, actually, the second half of 1A. You're not that actually absolutely right. I'm, I'm not quite sure why I labelled it that way. I may have taken that from the judgment. I apologise to my lady. No, no, it's, it's exactly that, 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 that's absolutely right. So it's the second half of, 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 of A, and then B is the alternative. Uh, if it's the bankrupt, then the bankrupt would have become aware. So there's a would have become aware at or shortly after the time of bankruptcy in each case. First, the OR, and secondly, the bankrupt. So we were effectively. We were effectively trying to seek a, a, a non-factual, factual declaration. A factual declaration based not on any contested facts, um, or, or, or on either legal hypothesis as to what the court might find as to whose relevant knowledge it was. This is where I'm afraid I, I became confused, yeah. because I, I thought that since this was a part eight um, chapter, eight, that uh, these were pure declarations of law that were being sought, albeit in the alternative. Yes. To the main submission. Yes. Well, what, our case was that there was uncontested, it, it, it reached to some extent into the facts, but only to a permissible extent for a Part 8 claim, and that there were effectively uncontested facts from which the court could make these declarations. Yeah. It rapidly became apparent that the judge did not share our, our well, ambition in that. Well, well hold on. If, if chronologically, before you get to the hearing, we also had the skeleton argument for the claim there. In the High Court, uh, and that, that uh, we, we can look at it yes. if, you, if you want to go back to it. It's in the supplementary bundle. I think I made reference to it yesterday. But um, and, and also there was the list of issues that may be helpful. Actually, it's in the court. I was going to come to the list of issues. Oh, do you in, want to go into that next? So at, at, in, at the stage of skeletons, we were advancing both of those alternative declarations. Yeah, but I didn't understand the way it was formulated in the list of issues, or indeed in your skeleton argument to be a factual declaration. It appeared to me, perhaps wrongly, to be an alternative legal submission. Do you want to take uh, us to the list of issues? Uh, See how you put it. Uh, yes, I, I, I can do that. Yeah. Well, I think that, that, the, that the answer is that embodied within what was overall a, 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 a fact, species of fact of factual declaration, namely a declaration as to the relevant awareness of the bankrupt, that the bankrupt would have become aware, or, or reasonably to have become aware, that he had caused a complaint at the time of the bankruptcy. So it was, in, in form, it's effectively a factual declaration, but within that was at least one legal issue which was identified by the parties in the agreed list of issues. It was, yeah, which page is a, 117. Which is 30, 30, precisely. And, and so one sees the, the, the form of the declaration in paragraph 3 of the list of issues. Mm. Um, if the irrelevant, when and one can see the bifurcation here, yeah. and it, one is if 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 the relevant knowledge is that of the OR, yeah. and the second is if the relevant knowledge is, is that of a bankrupt, yeah. no, I see whether that. it is the case that the bankrupt would have become aware. So overall, the judge was unhappy because he thought that even either form of declaration, including the second, was going to raise uh, matters which were unsuitable for part eight and a resolution. Yes, yeah, so but within but within points that may arise in answering these questions is the way yes. it was put, because the parties had rather different views, I think, as to precisely what would be raised, right. included uh, what, what you, my lord, had identified at paragraph two, yeah. if awareness of individual bankrupts is material, whether awareness, if any, on the part of the official receiver can, should be attributed to individual bankrupts. Yeah. That seems to me to be a proposition of law. Well, potentially. The, the, uh, my lord, uh, yes, it, will, it clearly is a proposition of law. Yeah. Uh, the judge, I think, was concerned. I don't think he atomized that from, from the rest of the declaration. He took a, a, a view at a rather higher level that the declaration uh, was going to involve uh, looking at issues of, 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 of fact as well as law, right. and therefore was not suitable, even if within it, buried within it, was an issue of, of, of law. I see that. But, but then we also had your skeleton argument. And it may be worth just, rather than talking about it in the abstract, if we just have a look at that. It's quite a short passage. Uh, it's in the supplementary uh, at page 92 initially. So yes. it, it's 
A and B, which I think reflects effectively the way in which the, the list of issues had identified the issues that you've just shown us a moment ago. But then when it came to developing the alternative case, yes. at page 125, at paragraphs 87 and following, uh, down to 93, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Herbert, because I may have misunderstood, but I, I saw that there was reference there, for example, to Bastard and Reynolds on agency at paragraph 90. A principle is generally imputed with knowledge relating to the subject matter. So that seemed to me to be, right or wrong, it seemed to me to be a submission about law. Your Lordship is clearly right that there was a submission about law there. Uh, the, the judge's view was that, was that it, you, one couldn't, the declaration sought couldn't be confined I to see. that issue of law because you'd have to be looking at a wider penumbra uh, of, of uh, if you're looking at attribution of what could be attributed, what did, what did the OR know, what did the bankrupt know, what was the interaction between the two, how does one cater for what should have been done in the technical manuals but was not done, were the technical manuals about binding, all sorts of is wider issues surrounding the issue of law, but which would have to key into the issue of law to result in the declaration sought being right. made, which is effectively a factual thing. Where does that leave us if we are persuaded that we should allow the appeal and that the relevant knowledge is that of the bankrupt? Well, look, what, do you still want to keep open for a subsequent stage the argument that if that's right, the knowledge of the OR is to be imputed to the bankrupt? Because if if you are, that's a that's a complete answer to the case in any event. Well, my lord, that is what the judge thought should happen. The judge, if one goes back to the judgment at uh, sixty-five, said that the sensible way, way of de dealing with this aspect of the complaint's jurisdiction is through follow-up proceedings. If one gets to that stage, through FOS or uh, the High Court, whatever system the High Court could give sample cases or test cases uh, where these but, issues. But, could but be that's resolved. obviously envisaging there's going to be some sort of factual trial. So yes, yes, exactly, my lord, yes. But I think my lord's point, if I may say so, is that if you're right on the imputation point, it doesn't matter if the knowledge is that of the bankrupt, because you still win, because the, the, as a matter of law, if the OR knows, the bankrupt knows. So you don't need any facts for that. All you need is a, a decision on the point of law. And that well, does I, seem, yes. speaking for myself, slightly absurd to require people to go through a whole factual process, if, if you do have a, a knockout answer of that sort. Well, I, I think, my lord, that the, 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 the judge's concern, it's a concern that we obviously uh, ended up absorbing in firstly making very abbreviated submissions on, on the point, and secondly, in not putting in a respondent's notice on this point to this court. Well, that may was be crucial. What, for both of those two, what, what was that? We, 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 we took the view that the, the judge saying, I don't think it's appropriate to, to deal with that question on part eight, is, 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 is a matter which we effectively accepted. It should be done one of these other ways. You need the background facts. Yeah. Uh, in, even if it's principally an issue of law, you need background facts as to who knew what, both the OR and before you can decide on matters of imputation, what's being imputated, yeah. Yeah. What, uh, imputed, uh, what, uh, uh, how these... Add, that, that was his yeah. view expressed strongly in respect of both declarations. Mr. Yeah. Herbert, can we just pause there for a moment? I think it's helpful if you keep in mind the strict procedural position there. So what we have at paragraphs 64 to 68 is a further decision by the trial judge, effectively in the exercise of his procedural management discretion, as he puts it at the end of 68. And is this correct? You have not sought to appeal against that decision. Well, that's that, undoubtedly correct. Yes. So that's the, that's the first procedural point. Is that, that that is not part of the appeal, therefore, Indeed. which is before us. Indeed. Uh, whether or not the judge was right to take that approach, I think you're, you're you're agreeing with me that we can't pronounce on that question because there's simply no appeal. Uh, uh, well, I, I am, my lord, and I have to say, it fairs to both parties. Neither of us have come yes. equipped to argue. Exactly. Well, exactly. Quite complex exactly. Issues. exactly so. And, and then and then secondly. Uh, Insofar as it may be relevant, uh, you have filed a respondent's notice in respect of the issue which is under appeal from the official receiver. Uh, 
and, and this is not the argument that we found based on Bastet and so on is not part of the respondents' notice arguments at all. Is that right? I think that's correct. Yeah. Uh, so, so is it therefore the position that um, this court is simply not seized of that issue of law? Well, I, I, I have to accept that. I, I, I think that must be that, and that's the, and that's the basis on which uh, we we have approached this appeal. The, the, yeah. the judge. Um, we have not sought to appeal from that. I, I, I can see the attractions of seizing uh, the, the letter. Well, there was much more evidence, uh, which hasn't found its way into the appeal bundle, uh, which you haven't seen, uh, which would raise all sorts of interesting questions as whether whether the question of implication was necessarily so clear-cut as, 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 as it might appear. Right. Well, that, well, that, well speaking of myself, Mr. Herberger, that, that's been very helpful. Um, I'm afraid I interrupted you when you were dealing with your first topic. Well, I, I think that I mean, that is that, that, that is that is uh, the, the entire topic. Uh, that, 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 that was the position which I wanted to, to, to put before the court, it having, it having been asked. Uh, despite the attractions of, 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 of uh, seizing seizing an issue, I, 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 the, the way your logic was, was correct. Uh, the, the, the second point was 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 a slight, was a rather more factual question that was asked. Um, uh, uh, by um, Lord Zandi Bamalady at, at, at various points about the um, bulk complaints which were uh, submitted to Shop Direct by the OR in, in, in or about August uh, 2019 and, and, and their status. Uh, as to the amount, which was one question raised, uh, the only evidence uh, was, was that filed in the other <coughs> set of proceedings, which, which compromised very shortly before the hearing. Uh, which indicated that that institution had been on the receiving end of some 116,000 bulk complaints. That was uh, Paul Nadia's first witness statement, which you don't have, about rough 13. The equivalent figures for Shop Direct were not put in evidence, and it wouldn't be appropriate for me to, 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 to give them. But I, I don't th I, what, what was referred to, and I was, was clearly common ground, is that there were a very substantial number um, taking colour from, I think I can say, from, 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 from the, the figures given in the other case. Substantial by in relation to that. Submitted by letter in uh, August 2019, shortly before the deadline. There may be an issue as to which letter it was, but that, that's irrelevant for present purposes. Can, and can those I ask again? There was almost certainly no evidence on this, but just a matter of interest. The, these are consumer complaints. Do we have any idea of the typical level of reward if the complaint succeeds? A few thousand? Or uh, Lord, yes, PPI complaints can have quite a range. Uh, they're, they're, they're in the thousands. I think they can be rather more than a few thousand, particularly given that they can date back a long way. And these complaints, the date, the date range for these complaints were the year 2000, sale of PPI back in 2000, <coughs> all the way through to 2017, I think it was, 18. So nearly two decades. So, so even if the principal is a few thousand, uh, with, with interest, it can be amount to a much larger sum. Uh, so, so, so they included uh, that range. Uh, and in answer to to my lady, lady Justice Carr's question about uh, or, 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 or statement about that they hadn't been rejected, that is absolutely right. Uh, what effectively happened to them is that nothing has happened to them whatsoever since they've gone in. They haven't even been accepted as formal complaints. There may be arguments of analysing about whether they fall within the definition of a complaint or not. But what was effectively happening was that the other set of proceedings were already on foot. Uh, it, it was a desire to, to, to synchronise the two and for us, to, as it were, to catch up. And uh, it was, I think, uh, uh, agreed on all sides, or certainly wasn't objected to, that the appropriate approach was, was effectively to leave them sitting there and to join these proceedings for clarification from the court as to the proper approach, for Shop Direct's point of view, in dealing with those complaints. And the regulator, the FCA, was informed and kept abreast of, of, of that course of conduct. So obviously the, the, the time limits for dealing with complaints have not been complied with in these uh, unusual circumstances. The FCA has, has been told about that and is aware of that. So that, 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 is, that, that, that is the, the stage which they've reached, as it were. Can I again uh, have a dealt with those points? Uh, Lord Zandi Bamalady raised the the vesting issue and, and uh, the question of, of 
whether complaints do uh, best in the OR. Um, now, the statutory position of, of, of uh, the OR uh, was, was, was set out shortly in, in uh, but, but uh, uh, we say succinctly and clearly in paragraphs 9 and 10 of the, of, of, of the judgment. Uh, that's page uh, 85. And I'm, I, I won't. You, 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 the court will, of course, have, have given close attention to the judgment. I'm not going to read it out again. But paragraphs nine and ten are effectively common ground. And my learned friend yesterday helpfully uh, took your lordship to many of the provisions, the underlying provisions which are cited there. One or two of which I'll have to return to. But th those those paragraphs effectively are common ground. And then at paragraph uh, twelve, he uh, identified wh where where as it were the divergence began be be between. The OR and, and the uh, claim. And he's, for power of 12, he said, as regards B, that, that by B he's referring to the vesting of the bankrupt estate, it's common ground that any right to receive financial redress awarded pursuant to a complaint, right to redress is shorthand, would fall within the statutory definition of property, thus belong to the OR under a statutory trust. The issue arises as to whether this entitlement forms part of, or at any rate exists in addition to, a distinct statutory right to bring a complaint right to complain is shorthand, and whether or the extent to which that rests in the, in the OR upon its appointment. And so, uh, and, and that, we say, is, 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 a, is a right uh, demarcation of, 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 of the essential question on this part of, of, of the case. Uh, it, as the judge uh, foreshadows in the way he puts it in paragraph 12, there is perhaps a, firstly a question as to whether it is even conceptually meaningful or, or possible to atomize right to complain from as distinct to the right to redress to which it is attached. But even assuming that one can, the judge was noting there's a live issue as to whether the right to complain doesn't also vest in the OR on bankruptcy. And uh, we, we, as I've already noted, we, the, the OR, we say, is forced into the position of seeking to atomize those rights and then to say that the right to claim, unlike the right to receive redress, doesn't arise in, 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 in bankruptcy because once it's conceded that the claim for Bests, not just the right to redress. It becomes clearer, as we, uh, as we shall submit under, when one gets to the disc rule, that uh, the OR is the complainant, because the OR is acting on behalf of the bankrupt only in the sense that he's standing in the shoes of the bankrupt in making the claim, in, 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 in complaining to Boz. And perhaps because of its position, its difficulties in its position as a matter of insolvency law. The OR, uh, in its uh, 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 skeleton, criticises the judge for venturing in, into what it characterises as a level of detailed scrutiny of insolvency law, skeleton paragraph 62, preferring uh, a relatively high level of analysis at skeleton paragraph 43. We say, on the contrary, that it is absolutely essential to understand clearly the insolvency law position, uh, and that the OR's analysis is not only high level, but partial and consequently wrong, and that it is, it is uh, that position, which the, the true position which the OR holds, which you then bring to DISC <coughs> and look at how the DISC rules accommodate. But Mr. Herberg, I, I, it's my fault, I fear. I, 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 I may have misunderstood, but I, I thought it was common ground that the trustee in bankruptcy, the, the OR, um, can bring a complaint. Uh, on behalf of, and, and you know, is that not that's not common ground? It, it, it is common ground, but for very oh. different reasons, I think. Right. We say you can bring a complaint on behalf of because the complaint vests, mm -hmm. uh, and and on behalf of means uh, stands in the shoes of C. Right. Plevin. They say, and I will be submitting. There's a, a bit of a legal black hole as to, as to how they justify. It. They say that notwithstanding that the right to complain doesn't vest, and notwithstanding that the bankrupt can continue to complain, nevertheless in some way they are acting on behalf of the bankrupt authorised by law in bringing the complaint. Yes. I and think we, they we, rely on the power duty, and hence power, to get in the asset. Yes, and I will be submitting that that is a function, not a, not a power, it's a function to get in the asset, and the way that function is exercised by the OR is through the vesting. Well, we'll go back to the statutes and I'll come to. It's quite clear. There's no, there's no, there's no power 
to get so it. If, if nothing best, if nothing best, you you can't you can't bring the complaint. But two point seven point two yes. shows you can bring the complaint. Yes, you can, and therefore our, our explanation is right. You bring the complaint because it's vested, and you do have authority to make it. Which means giving an unusual meaning to the phrase on behalf of. Would you say one that's justified in the circumstances? Well, my lord. Uh, on this clear authority, Plevin and the other cases, that that, 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 that phrase, the protean phrase, that takes its colour from the meaning, and this is absolutely the situation where what is accommodated is not on behalf of, in the sense of agency or some other representative basis, it means standing in the shoes of, and that meaning is expressly blessed in Plevin and, 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 and the other cases, which one I've mentioned to you. So I, I wouldn't accept it's unusual, it may not be the default, one normally thinks of on behalf of in agency terms, which no one says is, is the answer here. Um, so, so, so it absolutely, it's accommodated on authority and in the and, and, and in the words used uh, in 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 the section which I'll come to in due course. Can I can, can I uh, in fact take you to the, to the statutory provisions at that point at this point to make that good? I'm not going to go through all of them again, but it, 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 it is helpful uh, to uh, pick up uh, section three hundred and five two, which is. Uh, the authorities bundle tab three, page fifteen. And that you will see that the section is headed general functions of trustee. And subparagraph two, which you've already seen, the function of the trustee is to get in, realise, and distribute the uh, bankrupt estate in accordance with the in accordance with the following provisions of the chapter. The chapter sets out how they do it. That's the function. This is a very familiar statute giving a statutory office holder a function and then setting out powers by which they, 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 they achieve that function. And the function, of course, is uh, over the page in section three, very approximate section, section 306, vesting of the bankruptcy estate in trustee. The bankruptcy estate shall vest in the trustee immediately upon his appointment, taking effect. Or in the case of the official receiver, on his becoming trustee. And then one has the property not needing to be conveyed or assigned or transferred. It vests automatically. But doesn't um, a person have power which is necessarily incidental to uh, the performance of a function? You, you, can't, you can't just be given a function you're then not, at least implicitly, given the power to achieve that function. No. Is that right? Well, we, we say that the, 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 the function is achieved by section 306. There's no, there's no, there is, there is no uh, incidental clause here, and there's no need for one, because, because the two marry up uh, perfectly. The, 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 the function is to get in, realise, and distribute the bankrupt estate. Uh, and, and the way you do it's really the first bit we're talking about is the getting in. We're not talking about the realising and distributing at this stage. There are other provisions dealing with that, no doubt. But when we're talking about the getting in, one, one, that is achieved by the extremely wide provision that follows, with attached to it, the extremely wide definition of property, to make sure that everything that the bankrupt has, which should be caught and transferred to the, to, 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 to the uh, trustee in bankruptcy, is transferred, including, as I shall come to, Everything incidental to property and, and so on and so forth. So, so, so everything not only best it best automatically. No question of having to 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 to, to, to do anything, conveyance, assignment, or transfer. It automatically vests, and that is and what what the uh, OR has to do, common or garden task of uh, uh, making sure it knows what it's got, as it were. It's got it in law through automatic vesting, but obviously until it's administered questionnaires and, and made investigations. Won't actually know what is what is vested in, including in this case PPI. So the, oh, forgive me. I was going to say the very purpose of the vesting in 306 is to enable the trustee to get in and realise and, right. and then distribute the estate. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I see that. Um, speaking for myself, I'm not sure that you necessarily need to say that if it's the right to complain is part of the property, it could be said to be simply reasonable. Incidental to the performance of the function, but it may not matter. Well, that, that, that is one of the bases on which the judge uh, that found that it came within the definition of property, yes, reasonably incidental. And I, 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 we, that was our case below and remains our case. 
I see. There are two alternatives. We say it fits in actually two different parts of the definition. We say we always did it on two bases, and that's reflected in the judgment. There's one section where the judge deals with incidental to property. Then there's another section where he deals with things in action. Mm. He found, as we, did, as, as we submitted, that it actually falls mm. within both. As, as, as Ward mm. also found. Mr. Herberg, I, I, at no point do I want you to take your submissions out of order, because you, you will have um, a, a, a structure that you wish to follow, which is entirely proper. But, but can I just ask you, at some point, to address the question of whether you accept or deny that, uh, as well as the OR, at least in theory, the bankrupt person could still make a complaint under the scheme. And, and our answer is un unambiguously not. Yeah. Bankrupt has no right. Everything is vested in the trustee in bankruptcy. The, tr the bankrupt has no extant rights left. Not, on not only that he doesn't have a right to the redress, so that even if he complained, he wouldn't ultimately get anything. It's more fundamental than that. The actual right to complain has been taken away from him or her and has vested in the trustee in bankruptcy. And that's of the first importance, because one of the submissions I'll be making is that it would, it would lead to an extraordinary situation if, if both had the right to complain. Uh, it's not only that you might get two complaints to FOS, one has to look wider than that. We've also got to think about court claims, because another submission I will be making is that these claims to, the, to FOS are extremely closely analogous to court claims. I'll, I'll make that good. So you could, you could have, a, a, and the court claim, clearly vested in the trustee in bankruptcy. I don't think it's been, been suggested to the OR. It hasn't been suggested to the contrary. So you might have a situation where the bankrupt can go off one uh, the, the OR can go off one way with a court claim, bankrupt can go another way with a FOS claim, possibly at the same time. It would, pr practically speaking, it would give rise to great complications. I'm, I'm, I'm anticipating, rather, but in, in answer to your short question, I've given rather a, a, a long answer because no, that's to, to show you the way that I'm, I'm, I'm heading. So you were taking us through the insolvency act. Uh, Is there anything Lord, else you want to show? Yes. Uh, <coughs> and uh, in relation to section three hundred and six uh, one, uh, can, can I then take you to sh show how that operates to uh, a case that you haven't yet been shown, uh, or that's mentioned in the judgment of Gabriel and and and, uh, and uh, BPE, uh, which is in the Supreme Court. Uh, it's the second authorities. Bundle tab 30. Uh, at page 605 of, of, of the authorities' bundle. Gabriel and BP solicitors, uh, like many of the cases in, the, in, the, in this uh, 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 hearing, uh, Lord, I don't think that the, the particular facts are of, of, of huge relevance. It's a case, case concerning the cost consequence of the trustee. Uh, yes. pursuing a bankrupt appeal to the Supreme Court. Yes. Uh, but uh, the, the, the relevant passage in the judgment of Lord Sumption uh, is at uh, paragraphs uh, 9 uh, to 10, qu headed helpfully a question of principle. As he puts it, trustee in bankruptcy, unlike the liquidator of a company, is personally a party to legal proceedings which he has adopted. The reason is that the assets of the bankrupt at the time of the commencement of the bankruptcy vest in him personally and the bankrupt has no further interest in them. And I do um, underline those, those last words. The rule which dates back to the beginning of bankruptcy jurisdiction in England, currently embodied in section 306 of the Insolvency Act, the trustee's position differs in this respect from that of a liquidator. For although a liquidator is a trustee for the proper administration and distribution of the estate, the assets remain vested in the company, proceedings are brought by or against the company. It follows that with the exception of a limited and for present purposes irrelevant class of purely personal actions, I pause there to say that it was conceded below that uh, the rights uh, uh, are not purely personal rights. There's a purely personal rights exception for tools mm. of trade and yes. pers damages for personal injury and matters like that, which stay with the bankrupt. And it was conceded below, and it's embodied in the judgment. It hasn't been appealed that this is not a, cl a claim to FOS is not a purely personal right. With the, with the exception of a limited class of purely personal actions bankrupt claimant has no further interest in the cause of action asserted in the proceedings. Likewise, as Lord Justice Hoffman observed in Heath and Tang, where the bankrupt is defendant, he has no further interest in the defence, because the only assets out of which the claim can be satisfied will have vested in the trustee. None of this 
means that the trustee is bound to adopt the action. If the trustee does not adopt it, the action cannot proceed and it will be stayed or dismissed if the bankrupt is the claimant, e.t. Tang. So it can't, can't even be that the, that the, the uh, trustee in bankruptcy stays silent and the action continues. If the bankrupt is the defendant, an action which the trustee does not adopt is liable to be stayed. If, however, the trustee does adopt the action, he becomes the relevant party in place of the bankrupt. In the ordinary course, he will be substituted, but it's well established that he will be treated as a party, even if he has, in fact, adopted the proceedings by conducting the litigation, even if there's been no formal uh, substitution. And then, and then we come on to the costs and consequences, which are not uh, so relevant to this case. And I, I, I don't think I, I need to take you to it, but, but Heath and Tang, which was actually referred to in one of the cases that Malone Spence referred to yesterday, uh, is, is at uh, uh, tab 10, uh, page 236 of, of, of the first appeal uh, bundle. Um, it, it, it really doesn't take it much further, but I do commend page 238, uh, A to G, where there is a, 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 a helpful summary, including in terms the statement that uh, the consequence of vesting is that the bankrupt has no locus standi claim. That's in court proceedings. Is that in court proceedings? M M Lord, it, that, it was addressing court proceedings. Yeah. But we say the same uh, must hold in respect of any rights uh, which, are, which, are vest, which vest in the OR. They transfer over and the bankrupt has nothing left. So obviously it doesn't determine what falls in and what falls without. But if, if it's caught by vesting, then it moves over to, to the, to, it vests wholly and entirely in, in the trustee and bankruptcy, and the bankrupt has no rights left. And then there's the question of, of, of what is it, uh, what is it that vests, and um, obviously we, we, we've seen its property, and uh, the court has already been showed the extremely wide definition of property in section 436, um, one of, of, of the Insolvency Act. And if, if, if with the second the court's patience, can I just uh, go over that that definition again to show which parts we say are engaged? It's, it's tab three. Uh, page 30. And one sees that property includes money, goods, things in action, and I, I emphasise things in action because that's one of the alternative basis on which uh, the judge found this, uh, that, that, that the complaint was property. Yes. And there's two ands in my some reason in my my version and every description of property wherever situated uh, and also obligations and every description of interest whether present or future or vested or contingent arising out of or incidental to property uh, and uh, every interest uh, incidental to property is, is, is the other basis on which effectively the judge concluded uh, that, that, that we were within the definition of property in relation to the right to complain to the and Mr. Herberg, do you say that the statutory definition of property, which we find here, uh, could, in principle, be broader than the non-statutory definition one finds, for example, in Lord Wilberforce's speech in Ainsworth? Indeed, indeed I do. So, indeed. And, and as part of that, is it your submission that uh, to fall within this definition, an interest does not necessarily have to be transferable or marketable. Indeed, or, or marketable. We, we, we do submit that. One has to look at the statutory words uh, in, in, in their widest form. And I will explain uh, why, uh, I seek to explain why, why uh, one or two of the authorities which you were shown have ventured into marketability. It may be a very helpful test, particularly in cases where the interest is so exiguous that it's unclear whether it uh, comes within anything uh, close to property or incidental to property at all. And the obvious example is Ray uh, and, and, and the uh, um, uh, in, interest in, in, in renewal of, of the license, which was common ground, no legal right. It wasn't even a substantive legitimate expectation in public law terms, I don't think. It was a, it was a hope or practice that was normally followed. Maybe it would amount to an expectation. It would be interesting questions as to whether it was a substantive expectation with all, all the requirements in public law that, that, that arise. But it was clearly right on the edge. And one of the things you might look at in trying to assess the nature of that interest is, of course, 
marketability or transferability because if people, putting it bluntly, if people pay for something like that, it's, it's an indicia that you're on the right side of the line. So I'm not saying it is irrelevant to the question of assessment in some cases, but what I would strongly resist is that built into the, this extremely wide property uh, definition, which, which uh, as my friend said, Lord Brown Wilkinson in Power Drill emphasised was of the widest possible uh, 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 scope, uh, that one uh, 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 has to read in some additional super dealing requirement of assignability or, 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 or marketability. Even. But we would say that this, this, this case is a, a long way away from that edge. What we have is something very close to a cause of action, a spirit of action, a claim for, 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 for financial redress, which can be quantified on principles which are extremely close to court, uh, court, court, a court basis. I'll, I'll come on to that and the parallel between the POS regime and the court regime in due course. Now, uh, look, we say that the judge deals with vesting, well, the judge does deal with vesting, we, we, we say deals with it impeccably at paragraph uh, 46 and following uh, of, of, of the, the, the judge. I'm, 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 Mr. Herberg, I'm so sorry. I, yes. I, 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 I want to take you back, if I may, just to be clear about what your submission is about incidental to property. Um, yesterday, Mr. Gibbon submitted that the word property at the end of that definition uh, is in the present context a reference to the underlying policy. Uh, what's your submission? Do you say that the right to claim is incidental to something else, which is property, which I suppose could be the eventual redress you're going to get? Or indeed the PPI policy itself. Oh, you, 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 so you accept? I, I, I say actually those are both property, I, and I'd, I'd say inter incidental to either would, would fit the bill. It, it is it is uh, the, the right to claim in respect of a PPI policy is a right which is incidental to that underlying PPI policy. But it's also obviously to the extent that you can even meaningfully atomize these two rights at all, uh, incidental to the contingent right to redress which you get if you win your claim. And that, that is why uh, we, we do start off by, by, by questioning whether there is even any conceptual uh, coherence in trying to subdivide a right to claim from a right to redress on that claim. Because the two really go completely together. Even if it's not a chosen action, it's clearly incidental to the latter. And the latter is contingent property, and that's all that's needed, um, present or future or vested or contingent. What is the distinction <coughs> between a right to complain to a firm or FOS, which might lead to an award of money which does vest in the bankruptcy estate, and a right to claim under the criminal injuries compensation scheme, which might lead to an award of money which doesn't? The right, uh, I, I, I'll, go, I'll go back to the case in due course of, of uh, Campbell. Uh, but, but what was made plain is that at that time, at least under the, under the CIA Criminal Injuries Compensation Board scheme, there was no entitlement uh, whatsoever. You, you, it, it was it's more, it's, it, 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 it was purely discretionary. Yeah, indeed, purely discretionary. Is that is that the ground on which it's? Well, it's emphasised in the case. You didn't act, you weren't actually taken to the case. You were taken to the, the case that referred to it. Uh, no, we were, no, that's we, right. We, sorry, we, I, I apologise. You were taken to the you were taken to the case. It was the skeleton. But, but my, 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 my submission will be that it, it, it was not, uh, what was being claimed was not like FOS or a, a, a judicial, uh, under the judicialized system with, with clear rights, with a clear analog to court rights indeed, uh, in a system where, where, the, where the rights are being uh, effectively uh, calibrated by something very close to the court system. And the similarity is analyzed in Clark, and I'll come to that by Lady Mrs. Arden. Uh, but what, 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 at least at that stage, and I, I say at that stage because there's been development of case law in relation to the criminal compensation scheme, but at least at that stage, it was seen as a mere, a, a mere uh, ex gratio effectively um, uh, 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 award without not, not, I mean, not, not, not subject to any right of claim. So uh, the, the, the possibility that you might get an award, being purely discretionary, was not itself a contingent interest in property. You see, you you attach, you, you have two ways of putting it. You say either it's incidental to the PPI policy, which I understand, or you say it's incidental to the redress.
address, which is itself a continuum property. And the, it's necessarily implicit in that, but that's different from Campbell, because the possibility of it, that you might get an award, is not a contingent property, because if it were, it would have vested. Is that right? Well, when we're looking at whether something's contingent property, one has to look at, is, at, at whether it is property which is contingent. Mm. It's clearly something which... Well, once it's, award, once it's awarded as money, which is clearly property, but, yes. so, so, but at the stage at which you become bankrupt, all you've got is an ability to apply under an ex-gratia scheme which might lead to money. Yes. And I, as I understand your submission, it's the discretionary and ex nature of that right which means that it's not incidental to the money. Is that right? Well, I, I, I think that's right. I, I, I'll come back to the claim because I, want, I wanted to... There's a potential another basis, which is that it is a, a personal yes. right as well. Yes. And I, I, I don't want to make a submission without yes. the place in front of me as to whether it's also reviewed because it, it, it's quite close to pain and suffering type of case uh, and well, so on. Well, clearly some of the compensation is for that. But some, I think in the particular there was, there was case... A division. I think there was a division wasn't. between two, two types, wasn't there? Yes, yes. yes. Anyway, but, but um, the, the, ultimately there, there, there may be uh, some uh, interests which are so, so as it were, um, a non-legal expectation that, that, that the, the, the court puts them beyond, beyond something which is, uh, which is vested. But what, what, my fundamental submission is we are a million miles away from that, 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 that situation here. Uh, so is, is that everything in the Act, or is there more people uh, to show us? Look, that, 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 that is what is in the Act. I might, one might just keep uh, the section 436 open, and then one can see how it marries up to the judgment, which I was, was, was coming on to for a, mo for a moment. But that those, those are the crucial provisions of the Act, yes. uh, which, which um, uh, um, in engage with um, um, Lone Friend's case. M M the judge deals with vesting starting at, at paragraph 46. Uh, and once again, I won't, I won't read it out. Uh, the court will have, have, have looked at this carefully. Um, we say there, the judge is rightly identifying two, two separate parts of the definition of property uh, which are satisfied here. He, 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 he quotes firstly, interest arising out of or incidental to property uh, 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 um, and, and thing in action. Interest incidental to property and a thing in action. He looks at uh, both of those. And I'll make uh, short submissions on both to the extent I haven't already anticipated my but before doing so, I, I do draw to the court's attention the fact that the OR itself agreed consistently over many years in its internal publications and external correspondence that the right to complain, as well as the right to redress, vested in it to the exclusion of the bankrupt. Now, Lord, I don't seek to make a great big forensic play of this, and I'm not saying that the OR is bound by virtue of its previous uh, uh, statement. And so we have not burdened the Court of Appeal uh, with all the examples over many years, between 2012 and 2021, of the OR's consistent statements in evidence in the court below that the right to complain vested in the OR and that it was the OR who, who, who had the right to pursue this and, and indeed not the bankrupt. And they're noted in our skeleton below at paragraph 42 and footnote 8 just for your reference, it's Supplemental 605. But I, I would ask uh, your Lordship to, to look at uh, the one extract in the, in, 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 the bund in the bundle now, because it shows what they rely on for, for, for their propositions, which is what we're going to come on to. And that's, it, it's tab 20 of the Supplemental Bundle. last tab in, yes. in, in, in supplemental bundle. Yes. This is part of an extract from uh, the OR's technical manual, chapter 31.9a, Rights of Action, Payment Protection Insurance, December 2012. And this was a regularly updated manual uh, which uh, the uh, uh, OR produced to ensure consistency of approach among the various uh, 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 official receivers who, who acted. 
uh, it, it was an internal statement of their best practice, and individual ORs were expected to follow uh, the manual without a written explanation of any divergence. And uh, if, if one looks uh, uh, over the page at 31.9a.9 on page 214 of the bundle, One sees the OR stating that the right to pursue a complaint, this is a complaint, to a missold PPI policy entered into before the bankruptcy order, and the right to receive related compensation, so both of those from the complaint, uh, from that complaint, will vest in the official receiver as trustee of the bankrupt estate. Note one. And see also paragraph 931. Uh, 0.98.21, and, and, and the references to the notes, the notes are uh, appear a few pages further on, on page 219. Note one is just references section 306 of the Insolvency Act. And uh, once again, an explanation, insurance, pol insurance policy, PPI is type of insurance policy, taken out by the bankrupt prior to the date of the bankruptcy order, comprises property which forms part of the bankrupt's estate, that's section 436, Case law, note three is a reference to Cork and Rawlings, you will have seen reference to, has held that damages in a personal injury claim are not property, but that payment of, out of an insurance policy which covers the same type of injury is property. But, and this is common ground. By analogy, this will also apply to a PI, PI policy so that any payment from the policy will form part of the bankrupt estate. Any complaint arising from the sale of the insurance policy is property, as is the right to make a complaint. Uh, as, sorry, as the right to make a complaint can be said to be an interest arising out of or incidental to that property. Note two, which is section 436, and note four, which one can see from page 219, is actually the case of Re Ray. So bankrupt, the, the OR was citing Re Ray as, 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 as authority uh, for, for, for that proposition. And just very shortly, uh, <coughs> on uh, 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 page 217, paragraph 31.9a.21, mis-selling complaint vests even where loan uh, repaid prior to bankruptcy order. As the PPI policy is a separate product to the debt, it was obtained to protect. The right to compensation for mis-selling will vest in the trustee, this is the right to compensation, uh, even, vest in the trustee, whether or not the loan has subsequently been repaid. This would apply even if the loan had been repaid in full prior to the bankruptcy order, note nine, and note nine is a reference to the case of Ward, an official receiver, page 219. Although see uh, paragraph below. Mm. Now, now the OR, as, as is uh, its right, now wrongly, we say wrongly under the pressure of this disclaims that analysis. But it, we, we do say it, it was absolutely right. Uh, 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 it indeed, with reference to the authorities cited. Because once it's accepted that property, as defined, includes the contingent right to, right to redress, and indeed the redress itself, and indeed further, the assurance policy, which uh, underlies those rights, <coughs> We submit it difficult to see how the right to claim that property could not itself fall within the definition of at least being a description of an interest arising out of or incidental to policy. And we, we say it's not just the, the trying to divide the right from the claim from the right to redress is atomistic. It, it, it's that it's flat contrary to the statutory wording or, 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 or on, its, on, it, on, its, on its ordinary meaning. Seeking to split them does, as the judge says at paragraph 49 of his judgment, ignore the instrumentality of the former, the right to complain, to the latter, and the intrinsic connection, uh, 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 and indeed is, is, is undesirable. And see further paragraph 50, where the judge neatly uh, shows, we say, how, how they uh, 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 overlap. Their analysis involves such split in order to resist the characterization of any rights to claim as property which vests, uh, while accepting that they must that the right to redress his property which so vests. If the latter is property, being at least an interest which is contingent and incidental to the relevant PPI policy, it's difficult uh, to 
see why the former is not also or more so. It is present rather than contingent, and no less incidental to the PPI policy, and by definition a prerequisite to obtaining such redress. A statutory right to complain, even if juridic juridically distinct from any contingent interest in the financial address rewarded pursuant to such complaint, and that's the atomization of it, even if it is, is an interest arising out of or incidental to the relevant PPI policy, in my judgment. The position is even clearer when the statutory right is seen as a composite one, i.e. to seek redress by bringing the complaint. And that's, that's the sense of bringing the two completely together. You, you, you seek redress by bringing the complaint. The two are really different facets of the same coin. Um, is it wholly irrelevant whether the PPI policy is still in existence at the date of the bankruptcy and so vests in the OR? Policy might have lapsed or indeed been paid out. Lord, yes, but it, it is still a right to claim. Um, it's still incidental yeah. to the property. Sure. I suppose the point is you can have a right incidental to property yeah. in your submission, even if the property itself, which it's incidental to, doesn't vest because it ceased to exist. Mm. Yes, well, there, there is, of course, a different form of property. That may be where one jumps from mm. property, which is the underlying PPI <coughs> policy, to the property, which is the right to redress. Uh, which is undoubtedly an, and acknowledged to be uh, a, a, a contingent interest in property. So that right exists at the date of bankruptcy, by definition, otherwise you don't need to be here at all. So there, there, there are several species that can be nominated as property before one even gets onto what is incidental in this case. But what is abundantly clear is that those rights uh, vest, the right to property vests and comes over, and so does the incidental right to even if it can be atomized. And the judge noted uh, 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 supportive decisions of, of, of Re Ray and Ward of paragraphs 47 and 48 of his judgment as to the width of the definition of an interest arising out of or incidental to property. Uh, those are uh, the, the uh, two decisions which I've already effectively addressed you on, and uh, I may not, I, maybe I don't need to go back to them. You, you, you're, the, the, the court will have my point. Certainly, Re Ray as summarised by the judge at paragraph 47, uh, we, we, we say it's very helpful. It was a pretty exiguous non-legal interest that had to be uh, assessed. Uh, it, it may, uh, and that was, that was the explanation to references to in my submission to marketability there. You're, 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 the court has my submission on that. We submit that it is wrong uh, to... We, we, the OR submits that it's wrong to apply the reasoning in re re to a complaint under DISP, but we say the right to complain under DISP is surely a much uh, clearer case of property interest than the exiguous non-legal legitimate expectation in re. Uh, and uh, in relation to the objection that the right to complain is not uh, marketable, in, in the first place, I, I do make the submission that marketability is not a requirement of uh, the, the definition in, in the Insolvency Act. It's relevant in re because uh, it was at the edge of being a legal expectation at all. It was informal by practice, uh, and marketability was more relevant there. Here we're dealing with an enforceable right to redress. The issue is whether uh, the right to complain is incidental to that enforceable right to redress, and we say it plainly is. And similarly, Ainsworth uh, is in the same category, so I'm not going to go back to it. So Ainsworth, at, 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 at page 100, uh, 176 isn't of assistance. That wasn't a case directly addressing the, the very wide definition of property under, under section uh, 46. A and in any case, can be said to, 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 to be susceptible to the same explanation that the court was dealing with what is known very really rightly described as a footnote in history, but an important, very important right that deserted by, by its equity, uh, and was seeking to delineate the difference between personal and property rights. It simply isn't relevant here. And in those circumstances, it is perfectly proper to look at marketability or, 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 or transferability as, as an indicia, but not, not, we say, relevant here. But in any case, as the judge uh, 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 pointed out in the last sentence of uh, paragraph 47, um, the, the, wor the word marketability effectively denotes the characteristic that enables or facilitates the economic convertibility of the and in one sense, this is absolutely the most obviously the case here, because 
the right to complain. The complaint paves the way for money, monetary redress from, sale, from for the missed sale. And for what it's worth, we, we don't accept that the right to complain necessarily couldn't be negotiated for, 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 for money or <coughs> money's worth, whether or not a formal assignment would be usual or, or envisaged. Um, at the hearing below, neither side took, took uh, a, a, a position, a, a in principle position in relation to assignment. It was agreed to be a, 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 a grey area. Mm. Um, furthest learned friend went, is, is in the same, in fact, as he also go, went into his skeleton argument for this hearing at footnote 11, is to say that no more than that the CMCs don't, as a matter of practice, take assignments when they're representing PPI uh, um, uh, uh, claimants, which, which, which uh, I certainly don't quarrel with. But the, certainly the OR has never taken the position that the claim was uh, conceptually not assignable. And we say in principle there's no reason why, 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 why there couldn't be an assignment. We know from DISP's own terms that uh, you can be authorised by the person. Yeah. So, That's an agent situation. Well, that would be an example of it. But uh, what it actually talks about is just authorised by the person. Yes. So, arguably, you could ask a friend. Let, let, let's just suppose you, you, you can't read or write, yes. so you ask somebody to help you out. So, um, the question then arises whether you could uh, effectively sell the right to complain to another party for consideration, and then they would do it. You say there's no reason I have not seen any reason couldn't? of principle. I mean, if it was a court claim, you'd start getting into maintenance and champity and yeah. issues such as that. What about shark-infested waters now? What about the submission that, that when you look at the definition of complaint, has to be a complaint that the complainant has suffered loss. And an assignee doesn't bring a complaint that the assignee has suffered loss. And the complainant has to be eligible, and that means they have to be a consumer and they have to have had a relationship with the respondent firm. So the, the whole structure of this is that, is that the complaint is brought by the consumer who has suffered loss from a relationship with the firm. That's inimical to the suggestion that you can sell your complaint on the open market to a claims management company who's neither an eligible complaint nor has suffered any loss nor has any relationship with the respondent firm and the, the whole structure of this. Well, with respect to that, that can't be right. Can't why, be right because, because there are clearly categories of complainants who haven't suffered loss who do recover. Yeah, but that's because they're expressly provided for in 2.72, which says so is you can you can bring a complaint on behalf of indeed. But but an assignee in no sense brings a complaint on behalf of the complainant. In, in no sense, the, 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 the words on behalf of in that very small provision, we say cater for everything from Lord Justice Rabindra Singh's. Uh, uh, example of, of someone helping out someone, I want someone to do it on my behalf, through solicitors, through claims management companies, all the way through to persons authorised by law who stand in the shoes of and actually have legal ownership of the claim. It's a phrase that covers that full width, and in, in that full width, I, 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 there's no reason in my submission why, why uh, a, a, an assignee of a claim couldn't be accommodated. This is not the case on the, well, I'll come on to this, but I'll resist the urge to dive into the construction, but it is, it is not the case we, 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 we submit that the complainant, or certainly not the eligible complainant, has to demonstrate loss. The eligible complainant is, is, you have to get over the eligible complainant hurdle in 2.7, but we say that absolutely uh, doesn't stop anyone who's acting properly on behalf of, as long as they're acting on behalf of an eligible complainant from themselves claim. Can I just understand that? But you say an assignee, uh, could fall within the definition of somebody pursuing a claim on behalf of the assignor. It potentially, in relation, uh, whether it be a legal or an equitable side is another matter. And there, there are, these are matters on which both sides below, and I have to say that the same position perhaps remains. Is it, 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 we have there are no? I can't point to any authority uh, o, o, on this matter. But there, we say there's no reason in principle why that couldn't be the case. None has been identified by my learned friend. Yeah. Let, 
Lord of Friends points out that we, we both dealt with this very shortly in, in answering questions from the judge and the additional questions from Leonard took you to, and, and he makes the point that we, we said that we foresaw certain difficulties mm -hmm. in relation to such claims. Uh, and I, I said that it, was, it wasn't something that was looked at uh, uh, in, in, in enormous detail, and one can foresee difficulties without them being insuperable difficulties. Right. So, where are you going next? Friend also made the point that in Ray the, 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 the property uh, was was actually incidental to something that was real property, the four boats. Mm -hmm. But in precisely the same way here, the, the complaints here relate to the real property, the PPI policy, and, and all the rights of redress. Mm -hmm. Ward is particularly instructive because it's a decision obviously on this very point, even although it's only a county court uh, uh, decision, and then decision at the level of the county court. Uh, uh, the judgment below summarises it in paragraph. 48, and I won't go uh, 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 over the uh, um, uh, full case again. I don't think it's necessary, especially in view of, in view of the time. Um, but um, you, you, you will see from, from, from the case that one has in paragraphs 13 and 14 two alternative uh, routes to falling within the definition of property. Paragraph 13 is uh, incidental interest, and paragraph 14 is thing in action. We say it, it, it's unfair. Mel Friend suggests that in, 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 in some way the judge was unable to reach a settled view, paragraph 67.2 of the skeleton. We say that's unfair and unwarranted. The district judge clearly decided the case on two alternative bases, both of which are right, right just as the judge did in this very case and, ju and just as we submitted. One can quite capably, it's quite, it, an interest is quite capable of falling within more than one uh, part of that wide and compendious definition of property. And we say, uh, although uh, court of course is, 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 is not bound by ward and can overturn it, it is relevant that it stood for 10 years without being overturned and has been applied by, by the OR itself, footnoting it in its own, own legal guidance over, over that uh, full period. Uh, one other reason which, which the uh, OR gives for not following Ward is, 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 is raises a more substantial line of, of, of erroneous reasoning, which, which uh, if, if I can just identify at this stage and, and, and then come back to. This is a paragraph uh, 67.3 uh, of, 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 of their skeleton, page 32. They, they, they say, if Ward had decided that it was a personal status of eligible complainant that had vested in the OR, that decision would be wrong as a matter of law. While a cause of action is property that would vest, in the case of a disc complaint, which is not a cause of action, only an eligible complainant has standing. If the right to complain as complainant is what is vested in the OR, the OR wouldn't uh, <coughs> be able to make a complaint because he wouldn't be eligible. This would be an absurd result. But we say that that is to mistake what was found there and indeed in this case. The judge rightly uh, did not find that it was uh, the personal status of being an eligible complainant uh, that vested in the OR. There's no vesting of, the, of, of a status as eligible complainant. That's a red herring. It was the fact that the OR had the right to complain, indeed we say the only right to complain, which was the property. I, 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 I'll return to that distinction, which is an important one to come in a moment. So the other basis on which the judge uh, uh, reached the conclusion that it was a right to property was, was that it was a thing in action. And he dealt with that separately at paragraph 51 and 52. The relevant statutory right is also, in my judgment, a, a thing in action. Uh, and uh, uh, his analysis there, again, we say, is, is impeccable. In addition to the points he made there, it, it, is, it is supported by the decision of Clark, the, the, the Reyes Judicata case, uh, which I uh, uh, referred to earlier. But it, 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 is, it is helpful for your ships to see this case and leadership to see the case because it goes beyond the particular analysis on Mays Judicata to, to dealing helpfully with the parallels between the FOS regime and the uh, court regime in respect of uh, these types of claim, PPI claims. Uh, that, that case is, 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 is in the authority, second authorities bundle at tab 28. And 
that essentially this was a case where the ombudsman had awarded the claimant the then maximum 100,000 compensation and had made a recommendation that the firm should pay significantly more than that. You could only make a recommendation over 100,000. Uh, the claimants accepted the award, whereupon pursuant to section 228.5, it became binding on the parties and final. Uh, the defendant paid the claimant 100,000 but didn't pay the full recommended amount. The claimants then brought a claim against the defendant, a court claim against the defendant for damages for breach of contract and negligence, stating they'd give credit for the sum already awarded by the FOS. And the, the, the claim was struck out by the judge. Uh, the High Court allowed the appeal, uh, and this was the appeal to the Court of Appeal, which held that the award of the Ombudsman under uh, the scheme uh, uh, was a judicial decision and so capable of giving rise to rise to uh, raise uh, judicata. Uh, uh, <coughs> just going through the, 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 the judgment of Lady Justice Ardin as shortly as I, I can, at paragraphs uh, four to six, there's an explanation of the, the doctrines of merger and res judicata and, and, and the differences uh, between them. Um, uh, and, and note in paragraph seven that they're concerned on the appeal with res judicata uh, of the latter kind known as cause of action uh, estoppel. Uh, uh, paragraphs 17 to 28 is a long passage which I'm not going to take the court through now, but would perhaps commend it to the court if it would like more assistance as to the nature of the financial ombudsman service. There's a, under the heading more about the financial ombudsman service, uh, that there's more, there's more about the background, about the nature of the compulsory jurisdiction, um, uh, and about the way in which FOS uh, decides cases, including at 23 to 24, the fact that it's a fair and reasonable uh, description, uh, first, sorry, fair and reasonable jurisdiction, so that he can ignore technicalities in the law or lack of evidence, or award compensation which should not have been recovered in law if he thinks that's the right course. On the other hand, uh, on the other hand, he may, in any particular case, conclude that it would be wrong to depart from the legal position. Uh, this 3.6.4 fleshes out the position by requiring the Ombudsman, when considering what is fair and reasonable, to take into account the law, regulatory requirements, codes of practice, and so on. The power to decide a dispute according to what is fair and reasonable is not carte blanche. Uh, and then a reference to the, the, the IFG case. I mean, it's sort of familiar jurisdiction that the Ombudsman can, <coughs> in an appropriate case, reach beyond the law. But it's tightly controlled, and the, the the case of Edgecombe is familiarly cited for the proposition that if the Ombudsman wants to move away from the law, uh, the Ombudsman must identify that he's doing so and explain why that is done. And indeed, I'm next week in the Divisional Court dealing with just such a case, which is all issues of law, because the Ombudsman purported to apply the law. And so the legal question is, did the Ombudsman get the law right or wrong? In a normal case, the Ombudsman doesn't depart from the law. And one sees in, 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 in PPI cases, the Ombudsman is normally directly applying the law, for example, the Consumer Credit Act. And obviously the Ombudsman itself can't exercise a Consumer Credit Act jurisdiction, but the Ombudsman can say, I think the court would have awarded comp uh, uh, compensation under, under the Consumer Credit Act here because there's an unfair relationship, and therefore I'm going to do so. It's a classic example of applying, applying the law in, in, a, in a PPI context. And then one, uh, there, there are references to award, uh, paragraph 26, the, the award is, is enforceable in the county court. Uh, the, 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 the defining feature that the complainant can choose whether to accept, uh, not only submit the complaint, but to accept the decision, paragraph 27, that, that my Lord Lord Justice Nuji referred to yesterday, uh, and so on. So that, 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 that is that uh, entire passage is, is uh, perhaps, perhaps helpful in the background. Uh, and then at paragraphs uh, 44 and 48, I don't need to read, but the, the judge notes that there are opposing first instance decisions on whether merger applies uh, to, 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 a, to a decision of the first, whether it merges into the cause of action. And that's uh, something which the Court of Appeal effectively ducked, said this case has been argued on this appeal on, on res judicata. So there's no decision on uh, merger. Uh, paragraph uh, 50, you see, uh, although it's apparent this case was argued as well as merger, below the parties have argued this appeal on the basis of the more extensive requirements of res uh, judicata. Uh, no dispute that any of these requirements, except requirement one, the decision should be a judicial decision in the relevant sense of requirement, and five, the award of the ombudsman determined a question raised in later litigation. And what one sees... Uh, Yes, 
what is then the, the, the analysis of uh, 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 whether, the, whether the Ombudsman makes a judicial decision at paragraph uh, 55 and following, uh, and uh, uh, the con conclusion start at paragraph 73, and her judgment is that the or the Ombudsman can give rise to res judicata. The key point is whether a complaint could, as a judge puts it, never be a cause of action. Uh, Strawn submissions provide the answer to this point. A complaint may consist of or include facts which constitute a cause of action. To my judgment, that's enough to show the complaint uh, may be or include a cause of action. Because then at paragraph uh, 77, in my judgment, these points are not impediments to the application of res judicata. For the purposes of that doctrine, it's sufficient, as I see it, that the Ombudsman decides a question posed by facts constituting a cause of action. The rationale of res judicata would apply in those circumstances. None of the authorities shown us require the decision in terms to decide whether or not uh, a cause of action has been shown or what the party's legal rights or obligations were. Now, are we proceeding on the, ba on the assumption here that each of the complaints involves facts constituting a cause of action? I, I, indeed. One has to. That, that, it's all. That, 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 there is, and, I, and I'll make a submission in a moment about the, 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 the strong likelihood in, in PPI cases that that is indeed going to be fulfilled, as, it, as indeed it was in, in this case. My judgment is sufficient that he decides whether facts underlying the cause of action give rise to any claim, as between complaint and advisor, and whether the claim has any remedy against the advisor relevant relative to those facts. <coughs> uh, and, and so on and so forth. And then uh, paragraph 82 to 83, I'm satisfied that the Ombudsman's award is a judicial decision for the purpose of the requirements of res judicata, uh, explains why Note that Article 6 uh, of the European Convention applies to the process, strongly indicates the decision of the Ombudsman was a judicial one, the ECHR decision in Heather Moore and Edgecombe, the case I mentioned a moment ago, that the Ombudsman was a court or tribunal for the purpose of Article 6 of the Convention. Uh, uh, it is relevant. And 83, I note that the Ombudsman Service accepts that it makes judicial decisions for the purposes of race judicata. And we do submit, uh, in answer to, 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 to uh, uh, Milady's uh, point, that PPI claims bear a very particularly close analogy uh, with, 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 with court claims uh, in, in this regard. The, 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 the suggestion that the POS claims uh, are in some way akin to personal rights rather than property rights is simply not sustainable. And you will note that the judge concluded at the end of paragraph 52 that statutory claims of this kind are analogues, if not facsimiles, of causes of action at law. As he said, it's a matter of empirical notoriety that PPI mis-selling claims contain much of the juridical brickwork comprising either. And obviously, PPI claims can be brought on a number of different bases, but he, he lists out pleaded claims for damages for misrepresentation. Someone told you, led you up the garden path when they sold it to you. Statutory causes of action under the Consumer Credit Act, Section 140A, that's Plevin, the, the jurisdiction effectively created by Plevin and, and, and exploited uh, uh, so, so vastly thereafter. Or violations of financial services standards of conduct, which are actionable under 138B. Well, I put the question badly. May do, I understand that, but not necessarily. We are assuming they all did, are we? Or is that the assumption? Well, I, I, it, 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 is, it is impossible for me to say that there are no PPI claims that could uh, be but brought in, could, could, could be found by the Ombudsman in the circumstances. Mr. Gibbon made the, made the uh, submission it could just be a general sense of unfairness. It could be far willier than a misrep type claim. What makes that extremely unlikely in this situation is that the way <coughs> PPI complaints and claims are dealt with is not at large a sense of unfairness. There is detailed FCA guidance in DISP Act 3 in particular, which you've dipped into, but not to look at the degree of control, but you've dipped into, as to every stage of the complaint process, because this is the, the biggest issue the FCA ever dealt with, the biggest compensation exercise ever, uh, recalcitrant firms all moving in different directions. And what the FCA did was, is, is to set out extremely tight tram lines governing uh, everything from the presumptions which firms must apply when they consider complaints, the approach to the quantum of redress, how it must be quantified. We did look at some of that, didn't we, in Appendix 3? 
you did, you did, you, you, you were shown it. I, and I, I, what I haven't done, and I don't propose to do in the time, is, is to rigorously go through the whole thing to show the degree of control. But what I do say is that, 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 that there is no likelihood whatsoever that someone would fail to, to uh, um, uh, uh, obtain PPI mis-selling on any of those bases and yet be able to, to appeal to some general sense of unfairness. The whole point is to set out a consistent uh, uh, consistent approach for the determination of PPI complaints, all PPI complaints. Firms have to follow that process. Uh, and one sees many of the standards are actually direct lifts from court decisions. So Plevin obviously gave rise to a huge, uh, a huge uh, compensation exercise based on uh, the Consumer Credit Act. Um, but, but even before that, there were many years of county court skirmishing about uh, in relation to PPI, uh, which, which, which cross specialises with, 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 with the FOS. So if one takes a step back, we do say it's very difficult to see how it could be concluded uh, that, 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 that the claim uh, to court in respect of missold PPI, um, using a missale in the same broad sense as the Merlin Centre had, had, had used it, was an interest in property. Surely it must be. Indeed, as a, sh a chosen action, but that is a claim to the FOS for compensation for the same breach, inevitably <coughs> applying the same standards and seeking the same compensation was not. Indeed, if there was that split, it would give rise to formidable practical as well as conceptual issues. Um, if, 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 if one vested and the other didn't, if one did end up in that, in, in that situation, um, uh, right to complain to the POS in some way remained with the bankrupt, vested in the bankrupt, but the right to, to take a court action for, for analogous, uh, for, 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 an, for an, essentially the same claim uh, went, to the, went, went to the OR. One, one can see immediately the, 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 the difficulties which might arise. Now, a, 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 a different line of, of, of uh, uh, I, I suppose defence that the OR advances at paragraph 69 is to seek to uh, distinguish uh, Clark on the basis that there is no provision for, and indeed it would be incoherent to suggest that, a customer's status as an eligible counterparty could be assigned, alienated, or, or extinguished. Now, we say that that is to repeat the error which I identified a moment ago uh, of identifying the interest uh, which one has to consider whether it's property or not, the interest is the personal status of the eligible complainant. Uh, and and I, I referred to this argument a moment ago, but did, didn't, didn't fully address it. It, it is uh, an argument which is uh, first made in, in, in the skeleton argument at paragraph uh, 62 to 63. It, 
it, it, is, it, is a, uh, it is nothing to the point to say, well, it, it, the, the uh, status as an eligible complainant can't, can't be profitable. Of course, one element of the statutory test is, is not itself profitable. The issue is whether the right to complain overall, which involves satisfying the series of hurdles, uh, comes within the definition of property. We say the judge's reasoning in reliance inter alia on Clark has made it plain that it is. And we say that same flaw bedevils the uh, OR's attempted reliance on Walden and Atkins, the, 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 the authority <coughs> at um, tab 27, which the reliance plan relies on, 27 of the, of the authorities bundle, I hope I can say very briefly. It's relied on in footnote 9, paragraph 62 of, 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 of the skeleton. Uh, but effectively, the, 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 the same point is being made. The, the case itself, the, whole, the holding is, is, is simply that uh, the equitable interest in question was property, the incapable of actual evaluation at page 549. But the, 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 the uh, question which uh, is, is, rely, is asked and relied on in uh, uh, footnote, uh, uh, footnote 9 uh, on page 30 of, of, of the skeleton. Is Simon, is our Judge Simon Barth of QC asking, useful way of testing why the prospective CIC be award, and that's the award in, in the other case, not in Walden and Atkins, but in the Campbell case, useful way of testing uh, whether it was not property for purposes of 4 6 is to ask rhetorically at the date of the bankruptcy, was there something which the trustee could get in and realise? And then the law says, applied to the stages of eligible complainants clear there wasn't something, uh, that, that that was not something of itself which the trustee could get in uh, and realise. But for the reasons already given, that's the wrong focus. And uh, Lord, uh, in, in Campbell, further to my submissions earlier, I, I, I don't think I can do more than, than, than quote the, the court's characterisation, that it was a mere hope, and not a show's in action. Um, as, as, as the reason for the different approach. By court contrast, Walden and the situation here, it's obvious that there was, was something at the date of bankruptcy to answer the rhetorical question of, of the judge. There was something at the date of bankruptcy which the OR could get in and realise, namely the right to redress, which the OR accepts, lest in it. Lord, standing back, we say that the judge was clearly right to find that not only contrary to the definition of property in the Insolvency Act, to contend that the right to complain doesn't vest, but also that it's highly undesirable for any such separation uh, to be made. And as he put it strongly, as it being conceptually and commercially repugnant, but we would endorse that paragraph 58 of the judgment for the reasons that I've uh, already uh, given. And I, don't, I, I won't commercial repugnancy lies in the potential confusion between two parties claiming either the FOS or indeed court claims and FOS claims interacting. The conceptual repugnancy uh, is, is the atomization uh, and, the, and the, the, the lack of rationale for splitting off right to claim and, and, the, and the redress. Well, I don't think I, I need to spend a lot of time on the further authorities uh, cited by Lansom, but just briefly, he, he, he relied on Ord and Upton, uh, uh, 15 of the authorities' uh, bundle. Uh, uh, we say that's simply authority for the proposition that although uh, a claim which includes financial loss vests in the trustee in bankruptcy, he will hold as constructive trustee for the bankrupt those damages which relate to a personal claim, for example, pain and suffering. And it's accepted there's no personal claim damages here. So the case is, in fact, against the suggestion that the same entitlement, the complaint, can be pursued by two different parties, a trustee and a bankrupt. On the contrary, it was the trustee in whom the claim vested because it, in there was, it included a financial loss claim, but there was a constructive trust device 
to achieve fairness in the situation which doesn't arise here, that, uh, that, that there was also embedded within it a personal claim which, in, which um, remained with the bankrupt. The bankrupt couldn't claim that personal claim. And Morgan and Gray was the, was the other authority cited um, uh, in uh, uh, six of the authorities bundle. That's nothing to do with chosen in action at all. The fact that a bankrupt can vote while on the register is a consequence, uh, as the judge put it, at paragraph 102, I'm not going to turn it up, uh, it's a consequence of company law and the company's articles. It was a, 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 a particular question, uh, issue that as a matter of company law, if you're on the register, you can exercise the right to vote. Obviously, the trustee in bankruptcy can't vote until he's therefore removed him uh, from the register. It didn't have any wider things to, uh, um, to say about, about uh, vesting. And finally, the contention by the uh, OR says in paragraph 74 that complaints may have been made by bankrupts in the past. See, for example, apparently what happened in Ward gets, get, get, gets the OR no, nowhere. But this is, of course, a matter uh, of law. And indeed, it's possibly a surprising point to make in, in circumstances where the OR itself has adopted a different legal interpretation over a consistent period of time publicly and, and in its own uh, ma manual. <coughs> and the last case relied on was, was Singh uh, at, at, at tab 21, uh, which was, at that crucially, was a case where the bankrupt had no standing to pursue the appeal uh, because the estate had vested in the trustee in bankruptcy and he had no interest. Uh, the trustee's uh, right to, be, to appeal fell to be considered uh, in, 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 in that circumstance, where the right to appeal didn't automatically vest because uh, the assessment postdated the bankruptcy. So there are very particular facts in, in, in that case which uh, so we say don't apply here. Well, I've slightly scooted through those last cases, but I'm, I'm conscious of the time, and I'm conscious of the need to come on to, to the DISP rules, as, as, which is uh, uh, central to this appeal. And can I, can I then uh, turn uh, to, to, to DISP and, 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 as it were, move from insolvency to, 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 to financial services regime? This is your third broad topic. It is. It is, my lord. Thank you. And it's the biggest topic. Then left. Um, uh, it, it's the principal part of my submission. Can I start off taking you back to the structure of uh, DISP 2, uh, which addresses uh, in, in uh, its fullest extent the jurisdiction of FOS? So we're back in the, in, in the uh, supplemental. of this uh, two can be seen from uh, um, the beginning of, 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 of chapter two, which is uh, page six, page seven of the bundle. Yes. And what one uh, uh, can see from this two point one, two point two point one. Apologies over the page after purpose. Uh, an interpretation. It's 2.2.1 on, on page 10. Which complaints can be dealt with under the uh, 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 under the financial numbers of servants? And the scope depends on, and there are four different hurdles. This is really making good the point I made a, a few moments ago. One, the type of activity which the complaint relates to. That's just 2.5. Secondly, the place where the activity uh, to which the complaint relates was carried on. That's the, that's the territorial hurdle. This 2.6. Thirdly, whether the complaint is eligible. And fourthly, whether the complaint was referred in time. That's uh, limit limitation. But the important point already made is that el eligibility is only one of the four threshold issues for a complainant's amount before there is jurisdiction. Yes, a complainant must satisfy eligibility, but must also show, show, show all those other, mount all those other hurdles, including time within 2.8. So there's nothing to support the OR's contention or assumption, which underlay the 
distinguishing of several of those cases to which I've already shown the cause, that in some way this 2.7 eligibility is, as they put it at paragraph 44 of the skeleton, the focus of attention in DISP 2. Uh, and we also don't accept skeleton paragraph 45 that uh, limitation in DISP 8 is in some way ancillary to the principal provisions which define the operation of the DISP threshold, which they say are the provisions in DISP 2.7. In reality, there are simply a series of hurdles which must be surmounted before the court has jurisdiction. And incorrectly elevating eligibility to some form of principal or uh, independent status leads uh, to, the, to the error of approach in, in, in skeleton paragraph 62 to 2.3 I've already taken which proposes that our case must be the status of eligible, <coughs> eligible complainant is property, not our case. Can I then turn to, to, to the interpretation of the, the relevant provisions of this? Starting, the starting point is that the principles of interpretation to be applied are effectively common ground, and we say the judge properly directed himself uh, according to them. It's judgment paragraph uh, 30 to 31. He, he notes both the principles deriving from the gen section of the handbook and uh, general principles. And they were effectively common down below. And I certainly didn't hear anything in my learned friend's uh, 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 description which seemed to be taking a different uh, line uh, 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 on this appeal. Uh, I, I should address shortly, however, the, the, the relevance of, of the consumer protection objective to which he took you to, 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 to its in interpretation. Uh, and uh, it, We would accept, uh, at a general level, that of course one, uh, the, the purpose of interpretation of, of DISP involves bearing well in mind the consumer protection objective where that is relevant. But we say that uh, the consumer protection objective does not uh, bite uh, in any uh, uh, um, uh, particular way on rules of limitation. The judge rightly recognised that the, the consumer protection focus at paragraph, six, at paragraph 16 uh, of, of, of the judgment. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's not uh, the only interest, and as he noted, the scheme rules, including limitation, strike a balance between the interests of stakeholders in a way that gives effect to the legislative objective. And what limitation rules in their, do in their very nature is effectively to place limits on, on the interest sought to be vindicated in, in the furtherance of other interests, such as achieving finality in litigation, preventing stale claims, ensuring claims are heard when memory is a flesh, all, all the many reasons which limitation uh, in, in body. Uh, and so we, we uh, certainly wouldn't success it, uh, accept if it suggested that in some way the consumer protection objective of this means that uh, one reads limitation provisions in a particularly restrictive way. Uh, it, 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 uh, it, it is, 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 is an interest to be balanced, balanced with other <coughs> regulatory uh, objectives. It's a legislative policy to be priced into the limitation provision, as the judge put it at paragraph 56. But the whole point of limitation is to provide a, an effective end, end, end point. In any event, as the judge pointed out, consumer protection is not advanced by giving the OR an unlimited time to choose whether to seek to recover for the bankrupt estate. And against that background, I, I come to the meaning of complainant in, in DISP Rule 2.8.2. Yeah. Uh, back, back on page uh, 26 of, 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 of the tab. The judge principally addressed this at paragraphs 41 to 45 of the judgment. Your lordships will have considered the judge's approach carefully, and I'm not going to go through that line by line. Can, can I make a, just a number of points based on those paragraphs? 
First, we say the judge rightly noted that the deliberate, de the deliberate decision of the drafters not to define complainant, unlike other relevant terms, eligible complainant or, or, or complaint, and rightly inferred an intention that the term be used flexibly and contextually throughout the scheme rule. Secondly, the judge rightly noted, again, at paragraph 42, that in DISP 2.8.2, there are four separate references to complainant. And of, the, of those four uses, all the three uses surrounding the contested use in, in sub-rule uh, sub 2b, all the other three uses, clearly indicate that the word here in the limitation provision is being given a functional connotation. Right? A complainant means the person who actually complains, who actually <coughs> refers the complaint or who receives a response to it. Is that necessarily the case? Mm. Well, we, we, we say that that must be the meaning, and that the meaning must embrace, must be functional to, 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 to embrace the person who actually complains. If one looks at the first, the first reference, Ombudsman can't consider a complaint if the complainant refers it to the uh, Ombudsman service. So we're looking at the person who actually refers it, the complainant refers it. Look at, look at the next one, more than six months after the final response. The structure of these rules is the complainant first complains to the respondent firm. The respondent firm has various times at which it's got to respond. It sends a final response. You've then got six months to take it to the ombudsman. Yes. Suppose while alive and solvent, a consumer brings a complaint to the respondent firm and receives a final response and then dies or becomes bankrupt. PRs, what's, what's the position? I would have thought it's perfectly obvious that the PRs or, or the official receiver then has six months to refer it to the ombudsman. Well, yes. And in that case, complainant in little one doesn't mean the PRs or the, or the ombudsman. It means the consumer. Surely, surely these words have to take their colour from the facts. Well, they do, but that, that's precisely the, the functional definition is, is, is the one who complains. And, and, uh, but that would mean that in, in those circumstances, the first instance of complainant, if the complainant refers it to POS, would mean the PRs, and the second instance of complainant would mean the deceased. But yes. You would, you would accept that? Well, I, I, yes, but I, I would accept that. And it doesn't, it, it is, it is, it is talk, because functionally, in, in, you, in the situation to which you are putting me, putting to me, the, the original complaint was, was, was submitted to the firm by a different person. From the person who submitted the complaint to FOS, it was the and and it, I, I will no doubt be pressing questions in due course about what happens as, as my own friend was about what happens to time limits uh, where, where 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 time has started running or indeed has has, has finished running before bankruptcy. Yes. And yeah. my, my I, I, I'll come on to that in due course. But my, my broad submission is going to be that you have to treat the OR as standing in the shoes of this, this specialised standing in the shoes of standing in place of the complainant. Uh, and time doesn't start running again. We, we agree with Milan Friend, doesn't, time doesn't start running all over again. Is that a change from the position you adopted below? Well, no. I, 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 I thought there was a submission below that if you'd had two and a half years before you died, the PRs then got another three years. Or am I wrong about that? Well, that, that certainly wasn't the case that we advanced. Oh, right. Uh, okay. that, that certainly wasn't the case that we uh, advanced. I mean, so, I mean, in, in short, we, we will say that, that, that uh, if, if the... Uh, uh, right has expired before um, uh, at the time as it expired before bankruptcy then there are no rights to vest at all in the first place there's no, there's no vesting of rights because there's, there's, a, there's already a, a, a claim which doesn't get over the jurisdictional hurdle and that I understand yes. and I don't want to take you out of order at yes. all Yes. but what may be more difficult is the situation where the three years have not expired yet yes. it's undoubtedly more difficult on the rule and one has to adopt a purpose of interpretation based on the concept of, of the OR standing in the shoes of... Well, well, of, 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 of the so I don't want to take you out of order if you're coming back to this, yes. but this may be the crucial point in the appeal. Well, so I'm, I, that really goes to the meaning of paragraph B. Can I, can I put the point to you? You, you, you yes. say, as I understand you, because you asked for a declaration to this effect, and indeed the judge granted it, that in paragraph B, the words the complainant mean 
uh, in a situation of bankruptcy, meaning the BOR. Now, if that's right, why doesn't the OR have three years from when the OR became aware, or ought reasonably to have become aware, that he had cause for complaint? Well, we say that the best interpretation in those circumstances was the, the, the OR absolutely is the complainant in that circumstance. Yes. But when one is looking at uh, the date on which the OR became aware, or ought reasonably to have become aware, one has to adopt a purposive interpretation of what is meant there. And it is the OR, back it's, if you want to, it fleshes out the OR's um, full status. It is the OR standing in the shoes of the complainant, uh, having, having the rights of the complainant, having vested in it. The, 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 original complainant, the, the eligible complainant, I should say. Did the judge explore any of this? No. Oh, um, did you, this was, did you um, make any written submissions on, on these two uh, posits? Well, I don't think so. They, they, the issue was explored, as I recall. And I can, I can look. I, I, I'll, get a more precise answer after the issue was shortly explored uh, and what was effectively uh, treated as a, a, a difficult corner um, and, and it is a difficult corner not even under even under section 14a as this comment of Walker that, that, that yeah, this is an interesting question raising novel questions which hasn't been fully explored um, uh, you seem to be accepting is this right mr. Gibbons answers to our question yesterday, namely, scenario one, the three years have already expired before the OR ever comes on the scene. Yes. Both sides, in fact, now are submitting to this court. Yes. Uh, there's nothing for the OR to complain about. Scenario two is where it's less than three years, but time has begun to run. An extreme situation could be it's the final day. Yes. Uh, and what's your submission on that? That, that the OR has one day to complain? Well, yes, because he, he, inher what he, he, inherit, he takes what he inherits from, 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 the, from the person in whom the rights, whose, whose rights vest in him. And uh, look, we, we say that makes the best purposive sense of the provision. I get to the same uh, position as Mr. Gibbon, but not for the same reasons. Well, well, I, I understand entirely the way you put it, but uh, picking up my Lord's point, I don't think it, it means, therefore, the question that you asked and the declaration you got is inaccurate. Mm. Because in that case, complainant in little b of 2.8.22 does not mean the OR, it means the consumer. Because time starts running when the consumer became aware. You can't say the OR became aware two and a half years before the bankruptcy. But, but it, it certainly doesn't mean the consumer, because you're looking at the whole period. and and. By the end well, of the no, you're looking at the date on which somebody became aware. That's, that's, that's what triggers the three-year period. And the person who becomes aware is, is, is referred to in this sub-rule as the complainant. Yes. And the complainant cannot there mean, in, in the case my Lord posited as scenario two, in which the consumer becomes aware two and a half years and then goes bankrupt two and a half years later, the complainant there cannot mean the OR. The OR didn't become aware two and a half years before the bankruptcy. It must mean the consumer, which means, as I say, that I think, I understand entirely your submission, but I think that the, the declaration you've got is, is too unnuanced, if I can put it. It's too, it, it, it's too black and white. Uh, I, the the yeah. question, does complainant mean A or B, seems to me to be the wrong question. The question is, depending on the facts, whose knowledge counts? Yes. What, what triggers the, the, the three years starting? And I think speaking for myself, your submission is, if the consumer, while the complaint is vested in him, becomes aware, that triggers the three years. And if it hasn't, then it, it vests under the Insolvency Act in the trustee. And then it, the question is, does the trustee become aware? That's your submission. Well, well but my submission is certainly that, that read in context, the complainant here, it, it means the OR. That, 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 is, that is the fun. What I'm, what I'm then seeking to do is, 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 is make sense of, 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 of what happened in a, in a case where you have shared knowledge. And there are different uh, uh, approaches to that. I, I, I don't, my submission is not to undermine, I, I certainly don't accept that, as a consequence of what I'm saying, I, I certainly don't say that uh, the complainant uh, therefore means uh, the, the eligible complainant or the, the original purchaser in, 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 in uh, 2.82b. I'm certainly not, not making any concessions on that score. I, Even in the case where the, 
original purchaser did become aware through you? More than well, look, the way I the way I phrase it as, as purpose of interpretation is, is rather differently. It is it is to say that the focus is still on the OR, but when one's looking at uh, the, the the date of knowledge, one doesn't just take the OR as a monolith and and ask uh, um, whether uh, at a time when it wasn't even involved, he, he knew and get, gives, give, gives him an extra period. What one does is one looks at the OR as the vested rights holder of the complainant. And uh, it, yes. it, it, it may well be permissible in that circumstance is to look, when one's asking, does the OR know? One says, well, doesn't actually look at the OR himself, some person in the position of the OR know. One looks at whether uh, the, 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 the person in whose shoes he is standing, in whose place he is, whether that person knew. I'm afraid I, I, I find this very difficult to follow. Yes. Uh, I, I, I'm certainly not the reasoning of the judge, as I understand. Well, the judge effectively didn't deal with, 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 with the hard case that... No, but you, you're asking... You, well, first of all, you obtained a declaration of law, which is therefore, unless it had been appealed, is therefore binding on the world, because it's not confined to any particular facts. So that's, that's the first point. The yes. second is that, as I read his reasoning, and forgive me if I've misread it, yes. it was very simple. Uh, and I thought this was going to be your submission, I have to say. Um, I thought the submission, as accepted, is the complainant is the person who complains. See the Oxford English Dictionary. It's very easy. The person who complains is the OR. That is my submission. Right, okay, well, if that's the case, and, and, then, and then, as I understand the judge's reasoning, uh, he understood the nature and purpose of limitation clauses to be that that's the person on whom the discipline of time needs to be imposed. Okay. So they cannot sit around uh, having yes. found out about, or at least having grounds where they ought reasonably to be aware of something, they can't sit around. Precisely. Well, but, that, that but, it, but right. well, you say precisely, but with respect, uh, in the kind of scenario that we're posing now, uh, it's not the person who complains who's been sitting around at all, because they may only have had a day. And you're saying that in that situation, where they get their skates on, they're still out of time. But, well, the person, the person who's been sitting around for two years and 364 days in that yes. situation is the person who, who but for the fact of bankruptcy, was the person with, yes. with the ability yes. to bring the claim and to bring it forward. So in a sense, the limitation, what I'm proposing as a, as, 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 as a solution, effectively maintains the focus on the person with the ability to bring the claim to get on with it. it yes, it, and, it and that is shifts. what I think your submission really is, though you seem remarkably resistant to putting it forward, is complainant in 2.8.22b means the person in who for the time being has the ability to bring the claim. It doesn't mean, in all circumstances, the OR. It doesn't mean, in all circumstances, the consumer. It depends whether, it depends when time is triggered. And time can be triggered if the consumer becomes aware, well, he's got the claim vested in him. And time can be triggered by the OR becoming aware once the claim vests in him. That, that I think, well, I is really your case. But this, you seem very resistant well, to, I see the to force putting of, that forward. Well, I, I see the force of, 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 of the way Ronald puts it. I'm struggling to see whether it is necessarily inconsistent with the way I, I, I've put the case. Um, well, the, uh, I, I read the words on which the complainant became aware as focusing on a date on which an individual became aware. And you seem to agree that the date is the same in, in scenario B. It's two and a half years before the bankruptcy. But you want in some way, which seems to me to be remarkably tortuous, to say that the OR is to be treated as having become aware two and a half years before the bankruptcy, which I, I find yes. a very difficult way, whereas I would have thought it a much simpler way of getting to the same result to say, well, look who's got the yes. claim. Once they become aware, time starts running. But well, look, I, can, I, I, I can see that either route gets to the, the, the same conclusion. The, the, the reason that I thought that the, 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 the route that I was suggesting now was not uh, tortuous or, or, or unattractive is because of the particular nature of the bankrupt standing, uh, the, 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 the OR standing in the shoes of the complainant. And there is therefore more of a commonality.
between the two than might otherwise be the case where you're simply substituting one for the other. Mr. Herberg, um, we, we've probably taken you out of order Sorry. in your submission. No, no, no. Uh, these are important points, but precisely because this is so important, can I suggest yeah. that you take the opportunity to reflect and also to take instructions because of the short adjournment? Um, but can I also, when you, when you do that, can I ask you to bear in mind one facet of this appeal, which is that, certainly on one reading, this was not the judge's reasoning. And, sorry, don't, don't, just, just don't, don't, don't respond now, all right? Well, yes. Just, just bear in mind yes. that these are the sorts of things that we need assistance on. Right? Yes. On one reading, this is nothing to do with the judge's reasoning. And, and then we're faced with the uh, reality that this is uh, not uh, the subject of a respondent's notice either. Um, certainly, speaking for myself, and I, I may have misunderstood things, which is why I want you to take the opportunity to reflect and take instruction. I had understood the judge's declaration of law and uh, his reasoning to be very straightforward, right or wrong, but certainly very straightforward, that in paragraph B, the complainant in a bankruptcy situation means the OR, and that the three years run from when the OR became aware, or ought reasonably to have become aware. I'll just look at, she's passing to my lord, the actual words of the declaration. Yes, I mean, that, that's read. it. <laughs> Those are the terms of the declaration which are made by the court, and it's at page 81. Um, now, as I said, please don't take further time at this juncture yes. on this. I mean, it may. My lady has another question. I just wanted to, I, I know that you're going to think about this, but is there any bit in the judgment that addresses the consequences? in practice uh, of the party's rival submissions. I haven't found it, so it's a, it, there isn't anything in the judgment. Thank you, that was my question. Thank you very much. Uh, it, Mr. Herberg, it's entirely a matter for you uh, how you present your submissions and in what order, but it does occur to me, speaking only for myself, that because th these important questions have arisen only recently, well, you've been on your feet, and, and, and I don't want to be unfair to you or indeed to Mr. Gibbon. Um, would it be helpful if we were to adjourn now uh, and then resume earlier than we normally would? No, I, I think that, that would be very helpful. I, I think it, 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 I don't want to press on with, yeah. with, with submissions on other points and then effectively have, have to rethink I, this. I understand. But then, then what I'm going to do is, given the time, I'm going to adjourn the hearing now and we will resume at 1.35. Can I, just before you leave court, um, apologise earlier, I had thought, mistakenly, that you were making a submission below, the time ran again once the OR was appointed. In fact, it was in the skeleton argument for the claimants in the other case. You'll find that at page 85 of the core bundle, uh, sorry, supplemental bundle, and I mistakenly assumed that you were aligned with, with them. But I, that was a separate 